This may seem like a bold statement, but I think Koreans and Korea as a country would dominate any esports game. Now, there's a caveat to that. First of all, this is based on my own experience and observation of many different esports games and throughout like over a decade, almost 15 years at this point in time. And secondly, when I say that, I don't mean that they will now and that in every single game you should expect them to dominate and that they automatically should be the best. But this is the caveat. If Koreans are really enthusiastic, obsessed with the game, and it's very played in their country, and their esports infrastructure fully locks into the game, like it has done with Brood War, like with League of Legends, with StarCraft II, to a degree, then I think that they would become eventually the best country in the world in the game. And what I mean by that is, first and foremost, when I say esports games, I should categorize that. I, I categorize esports games as games in the FPS genre, games that are MOBA or arts games like Dota League of Legends, and RTS games. So in FPS we've got like Quake and Counter Strike, in MOBA we've got League of Legends, Dota 2. In RTS we've got obviously StarCraft 2, going back we had Warcraft 3, Brood War. These are the only games I have any expertise in or any decent amount of expert knowledge and research in, so I won't speak to other games. Like, I don't know about driving games or, or other types of strategy games, so I, I won't speak to those. So those are what I'm calling esports games. And so within those games, even though in some of those games they haven't dominated, I think that they would dominate if the first condition were the case, that they were obsessed with it, the country really took the game up and embraced it, and then the esports infrastructure in integrated it into their, their system and had their team house system and all the rest of it. And when I say dominate, that's another point to make here. When I say they would dominate something like Dota 2 or Quake, games that they've never really had any traditional dominance in whatsoever or anything close to it, what I mean is that it's not that they would always have the best team or the best player, but they would have the best, they would have the most overall number of top teams and top players compared to any other country whether that's by a little bit or by a lot, but they would have they would have the most. Now, the reason why I make that caveat also is because we've seen in different games, even if one region dominates, geniuses, genius teams and genius players can arise from other games. So for example, in, in Counter-Strike, my home, one of my home games, Sweden are the Koreans of Counter-Strike, okay. They were the team, the country that has always produced the most top teams. And so they have dominated Counter-Strike from that respect. Now, in terms of having the best team all the time, no, that's not always been the case. In the early days, it was, but then there have been at uh, different times in history, the best team in Counter-Strike has been from America, North America, it's been from Brazil, it's been from China, it's been from Korea, ble uh, no, actually, what? I scratched that, I don't know why I said Korea there, I, I think I just got caught up into my list there, but it's been from China, um, where else, Denmark, uh, it's been from Ukraine, it's been from Poland, so you can see there's actually quite a wide spread of where the best team has been on for, at different points in time. The difference is, even in those eras where a team from Brazil or a team from China was number one, for however briefly, if you'd have done the top five teams in the world at the time, the elite teams, there would have been more Swedish teams within that top five than any other country. So usually it'd be like two out of the top five, or in the early days, sometimes it was three or four out of the top five. And so overall, Sweden always dominated, regardless of genius players coming elsewhere. Likewise, in League of Legends, when the Koreans rose up and became dominant, yes, they were the best, they had the best overall number of teams, but a team like Gambit could potentially beat them. Still, a great team could still have a great result. See? CLGU in season two could beat them at some time, certain teams. So it's still going to seem like a shocking topic before I expand it out, especially from people like games like Quake and Counter Strike and Dota 2, as to how I could say, well, how can you say Koreans would be the best? Well, what sparked this, this topic in my mind is this is a topic I've often thought about and I've kind of I've worked on this theory on my, my own, but today is the birthday of one of my favorite Counter Strike players of all time, a player called Solo, and he played for teams like Project KR. Eastro, We Made Fox, these Korean teams. And what's interesting is he's a Counter-Strike player and he's from Korea, yet he's one of the greatest players of all time. Like if I do a top 10, top 15 players of all time, he's gonna be on there. And yet historically, Counter-Strike's a European game. If not Europeans, then maybe you have North Americans there. And then after that, you have the odd geniuses from like China, Brazil. But in general, Korea never had any place. Korea as a country never embraced Counter-Strike. It was never played a lot in the PC banks. It never had many big leagues. It never had proper support aside from one or two teams at certain points in time. And yet this guy's one of the greatest ever and he had some pretty good accomplishments. And so as I break down why that why that was able to happen, you'll see that the system that they have in place there and the mentality and the cultural kind of aptitude for these sorts of games once they embrace them is so overwhelming that if you just add in enough people doing all this, it is almost inevitable they will become the best 
unless it's for another game that I don't, I'm not aware of any sports. Like I said, if it's another game outside of those genres I mentioned, maybe there's some caveat or some reasoning as to why they wouldn't be, but I, I don't know what it would be. So first of all, let's talk about the games that Korea has embraced like this and that as a result has dominated. So the two games in history that really stand out as social phenomenon, where Korea as a country was obsessed with it, their gaming culture went full bore at it, they had all the team houses, the full structure, the whole nine yards. The two games is Brood War and League of Legends. Now, when it was just Brood War, it was just StarCraft Brood War, there was a degree to which you could just say, okay, well, they were by far the most dominant. All the greatest players. If you did a list of the top 20 greatest players in the history of Brood War, they're all Koreans. There's no non-Korean person would even be close to the list. Not only are they the greatest and on this list like this, but crucially, part of the reason why someone could have always said as a get out if they weren't from Korea was like, oh, but the rest of the world didn't care about Brood War much after say like the first few years, like they only had a small scene in the West. Okay, that's fair enough. It's true to a degree, but League of Legends is what changes the game with that. Because when League of Legends came along, not only was Korea not initially involved in League of Legends, it didn't have its own server until 2012. I think it was 2012 when the Korean server came out. Yeah, I think so. Um, but crucially, the, the, the West, Europe, North America had had their servers and had been playing it full and had a pro scene even before Korea got involved. So they had a head start, they'd figured out all sorts of things about the meta, all kinds of things. And Korea got engaged, had its OGN seasons, started playing. Everyone, it became a social phenomenon like Brood War had within Korea, where if I go into a PC bang now, anywhere in the city, if I just see the word PC on the wall and I go into that building, it will have dozens and dozens of people playing these games. It'll even have like one or two people still playing Brood War. That's what a phenomenon Brood War was in terms of how it affected the culture. So it, it's a huge game. And what we've seen now is Korea has dominated League of Legends in an unreal fashion. Now, it might not have initially seemed like it in League of Legends because actually the first season Korea was involved, there was a shock. Taipei Assassins from Southeast Asia, even Taiwan, Hong Kong, managed to win the title. But Korea finished second. Korea had two teams in the top eight. That's the thing, if you look at my category of dominating in terms of most top teams, Korea even back then had started to dominate. I, did, I categorized, I went through the history of League of Legends and I wanted to forget the numbers for this. In tournaments where Korea sent teams to tournaments that were played at, that also featured Western teams. And I, and by the way, I removed, for example, WCG 2013, where Korea had a top team, but West really had almost no real representation. But I picked out all these tournaments. I found 17 tournaments, okay. Out of these 17 tournaments, 12 of them were won by Korean teams, and in 14 of the 17, a Korean team made at least the final. And out of the 12 titles they won out of the 17 tournaments, the last seven of them in a row were won by Korea. Now, of those 17, you know, there's five there that they didn't win. One was before, was in 2011, WCG, when they didn't even have a server and they were, they were just having to play on NA and there was really no scene there, there were no tournaments. So take that off and you go down to 16. They won 12 out of the 16 in eras when they were even involved in the game, properly playing the game. This is on real levels of dominance. No one else is even close as a region. So, okay, those are the two games they have dominated. Now we'll go into the worlds where, before we get into the hypothetical of what would happen elsewhere, let's look at other games that they didn't dominate, but even with limited interest from the Korean populace and limited esports in... Um, infrastructure behind them they were able to have success in a number of other games within those genres i mentioned so the first one we have to mention is warcraft 3. so historically in warcraft 3 yeah they had leagues early on but there were a bunch of things that went on like i think there was some match fixing or something some things that kind of soured them on it and they were also in love with brood war still and that was so prevalent within their culture that warcraft 3 never really took off properly not all the teams didn't just all get different players and so a lot of the big organizations in warcraft 3 were european orgs so for example people like sk gaming had players from Korea and that's the thing and MYM had players you know all these different areas all these different orgs in Europe that was the main area for Warcraft 3 it was mainly about Europe was Warcraft 3 and then obviously China became involved and China was a big force later on so in Warcraft 3 a game they weren't as into as they were in Brood War and now League of Legends they still had numerous great players some of the greatest players of all time I mean they had players like Lin who won numerous big champions won the IEM World Championship he won big, big tournaments, lots and lots of top fours, top three placings. They had players around 2005 who were very good. Like I mentioned there, Sweet played for SK Gaming. They had a bunch of players around that level. And then crucial, oh, I won't say crucially for the millionth time, but, but what's worth noting is that even without this massive level of in, in, involvement, Walker 3 had, Korea had arguably the greatest Walker 3 player of all time, which is Moon. Now, even if you don't think Moon's the best player of all time, he's at least been in your top two. And worst case scenario, no matter what, 
criteria you use for judging the best player of all time. He's at least third. I'd say he's probably number one. He's got the, he had the most prize money. He's won the most tournaments. He had the most dominant year by far in 2007. I mean, this guy's one of the best players ever. And yet this wasn't with like the full backing of the green esports industry and the structure and all the people in Korea being obsessed with it and playing at PC banks. No, it wasn't really the case. It had a healthy scene. Walker 3, of all these games we're going through now, was the healthiest of the scenes outside of Brood 1 League of Legends in terms of Korea embracing it, but still not so much. So, okay, let's go to Counter-Strike. What initially sparked me to kind of kind of bring this topic up. So in Counter-Strike, Korea had almost no scene whatsoever. It was really, really bad. And part of that was the problem that, like, in Korea, a big part of it's either games you can, like, pirate onto the PC cafes or you play for free. And so no one played Counter-Strike. Like, people back then, you had to have a Steam account, you had to have bought the game. It just wasn't played. And plus, FPS wasn't that popular. So if people did play FPS games in the modern day, they've played games like Crossfire... Uh, sudden Attack, I think, was one which were like free-to-play games and crucially made by Korean companies, so they're pushed by the PC banks and the, and the Korean gaming industry. And then CS Online was like a version of 1.6, and that was the problem, is that the main CS 1.6 version, even the people who played that sort of game would play a non-Steam version, so you could kind of pirate it, or later on they'd play CS Online, and these games were popular, but they never played 1.6, and they were never interested in 1.6, and they didn't know much about the, the pro scene, which mainly was taking place in Europe for the latter half of the game. And yet, despite this, Korea had some pretty significant results in CS 1.6. Like in 2004, back when the best teams were still the elite teams from Europe and then one or two teams from North America, around this time, Project KR, this team that had, uh, no, no, Project KR, Maven, a team that would later on become Lunatic High, managed to steal away the bronze medal at WCG 2004 away from SK Gaming, which had like Potty, Heaton, um, spawn these like legendary players who were some of the greatest players of all time they managed to steal a medal away from them then they became lunatic high and the next year with like a slightly different roster they managed to finish fourth ESWC which was one of the majors WCG was a major as well by the way fourth ESWC one of the majors and then they managed to finish second at CPL winter 2005 which is another major tournament we only had two, three or four majors per year second at that major and that by the way is considered one of the most stacked majors ever in history like all the great teams were there in that period in time they finished second this Korean team then that's just one group of Koreans a totally separate group of Koreans fielding this player I talked about the greatest Korean player solo this team initially it was called Project KR and they had these tournaments within Korea which were these leagues but they invited top western teams okay well at WEG season 3 they had a number of the best western teams and the best Chinese team and they managed to finish second then the next year early on they had a monster tournament where the first place was like a hundred thousand dollars was it 100,000 or was it 75,000? Yeah, it might actually have been 75,000. It was eventually won by this Chinese team, WNV, who at the time were the best in the world and won the previous one. But again, there was the best There was the best uh, North American team, Complexity. There was SK Gaming, who'd won the CPL Winter. There were all the best Western teams, or most of them were there. Third place, this Project Car team managed to take. Now then, later on, years later, they became Eastro. Same lineup, well, slightly different lineup, but same core players, and crucially, Solo's still there, this star player. In 2008, they had an amazing run where they managed to finish second at the first major of the year, the IEM2 Championship Finals, finished second place. They finished second at the next major in the year, ESWC, losing one of the closest finals ever to the Poles, who've won, won a lot of majors. They finished third at WEM, which was a big tournament with top teams from the West, but within the Chinese region. Uh, yeah, it was in China. Uh, they finished third at the, at the third major of the year. So in, in the three majors of the year, they finished top three at all of them. They finished third place and won the bronze at WCG that year. And they won a tournament just within Korea, but which Fnatic of like Forest, Khan, DSN, all attended, and they beat them. And that year they beat Fnatic a bunch of times, one of the best teams in the whole world. So this was actually an incredible run. Like that year for me, they were like the third best team of the whole year. And yet they were this Korean team. And so, oh yeah, and one last detail. Finally, in 2010, that solo guy did manage to win an international event. He won WEM, again, it was in China, and it had all the best teams in the world. It had Navi, who were the dominant team of that year. It had the Poles, it had Forest's uh, Fnatic team. It had, um, who else? I think it had everyone except MTW. I think that was the only great team that didn't go. So in this particular scenario, one of the greatest they had one of the best, they were third place one of the years and they had numerous placings in top majors and yet here's the context for you. In CS, not only did they not have all that stuff I described before, but because they didn't have many top teams, they only had these two different groups and then one of them was earlier on and then wasn't later on and one of them, the, the solo one, kind of went through time. They didn't even have anyone to practice against. Like actually, I knew these players and I interviewed them many times. The way they used to practice 
was this was one of the few teams actually who did have like a, an, an office space to play from within Eastro and we made Fox this Korean like Starcraft two, a Star, a Brewdor team rather that had a CS division as well they had space to play from so they would go there and they would play every day and they would try and play anyone they could find sometimes they'd play with bad ping on like Chinese people it wasn't very really good practice other times they'd just have to play bad amateurs who weren't even close to their level so it wasn't good practice at all so what they ended up resigning themselves to doing was deciding right well rather than just give up and say right well we can only go to tournaments every few months so we'll wait until the tournaments and then we'll start practicing when they were at home, they would just go into empty servers and just try run tactics all day long. And what they would do is plan out tactics to a degree that like barely any European teams even got to this level. Like some teams like MTW, etc. these great tactical teams were able to get incredible levels of like flashbang timing. But this Korean team with no, with no one else to play against went to like probably the highest level anyone's ever gone to where they got their timing down so well on coordination on how to attack that like there's videos online of it where every single guy a flashbang's going out and he's looking away from it and then the second he turns back is when the flashbang's just gone off around the corner and blinded the opponent but he won't be blind as he comes around and their coordination on how to attack and do this was unreal it was really impressive so they did that first of all and then what they would do was before certain big events when they could they would get their organization to fly them out to sweden and they'd go and practice for a week in the boot camp area before uh, um, not at boot camp area, at a LAN cafe, Inferno Online, they'd go and practice there for like a week before the event to get up to speed and practice some European teams. And that's all they had to compete against the best European teams who were playing each other all the time, going to all the tournaments. And they'd be, maybe only be going to five or six tournaments a whole year, whereas a European team might go to 10 to 12 events, however many you want to go to, you know. And yet they were able to have this level of very significant results compared to some of the least resources you could ever imagine as a team. Now then, one last game I want to bring up is Quake. Because in Quake... A lot of people who are even experts about Quake are going to think, well, Quake had no representation from Korea in because it's true, you look at like Quake Live, there's nothing. But actually in the early days of Quake, when the game was still wide open and the CPL circuits were running in 2000, 2001, this sort of era, when it, we just heard that there were going to be these big 40k tournaments, etc. And anyone from around the world just started practicing and trying to play regional events then get to these tournaments. So before it was all very structured and we really did have these few great players who always made the finals. Okay, so the first huge tournament in Quake 3 was the Razor CPL, the one that was $40,000 first place. And famously, it's the one that Fatality won, and it was his first huge world championship type title, and it launched him as like the superstar of Quake, and he went on to be very dominant that year. At that tournament, people will forget this, but third place finisher in that tournament was a guy called Power K from Korea, and he had super sick rail, he had a really good shotgun, and he managed to finish in third place overall. He beat out a whole bunch of other players. He, he finished ahead of like legends like Lakerman, Blue... Uh, Duma. He finished ahead of tons of great, great European Quake players and North Americans. Obviously, there's only two players finished ahead of him. Now then, later on um, the same year, Fatality went... To, it actually wasn't that long after, a few months later, I think, Fatality went to this tournament in Asia called the uh, CPL Atomic Asia, it was called. And at this tournament, a Korean player, a total unknown, a guy called S21.0, actually beat Fatality on a map. And at the time, Fatality was the best player in the world. He was great on all the maps. This guy beat him on a map. Admittedly, Fatality came back through the lower bracket, met him, crushed him completely, and that guy ended up finishing, like, I think third place. No, I think it was fourth, actually. He finished fourth place. Later on, oh, another player as well, not that long after, like, the next year, there was a player called Elan, who was a, a, a Korean guy, and he managed to finish second in a different Asian tournament, which wasn't as stacked. He still finished ahead of Python, a very good Australian player. And crucially, he managed to finish eighth place in Babbage's, which is one of the most stacked Quake 3 1v1 tournaments ever. It was very, very stacked. And he finished eighth place. So, okay, not amazing. Some of these aren't amazing. The, the third place one was very good, but these aren't amazing. But again, Quake's never had any kind of impact on Korean esports. It's never had any infrastructure behind it. It's never had any application of like everyone start practicing and everyone's playing and everyone wants to be the best in Iran and yet even with the meager amounts they were able to bring forwards just the players being super diligent practicing practicing even against lesser opponents and not giving up they were able to have an impact so you've seen across all these games you've managed to have varying degrees of impressive results no matter which game it is and what the context and original heritage of where the normal great players are seeded and where they tend to come up and battle each other it doesn't matter Korea ends up having an impact so now that I've said all that you might say to yourself, if you're from Dota 2, let's say you've, let's say you stuck it out through this far through the video, in which case props, you're going to think to yourself, ah, this is the problem, okay? I always used to ask people in Dota 2 before I'd paid much attention, like, oh, is Korea going to get involved in it? And some of them naively would tell me, like, oh, yeah, Korea's already involved. 
and I'd go like, no, no, I mean, re- I mean, like really involved. And I'd explain what I said there, like the, the cultural phenomenon of Brood War and League of Legends. And if they get really involved, that's when they'll become top teams. And they'd be like, no, no, they are. They've got their own league, and uh, there's MVP Phoenix and the Zephyr. Yeah, Zephyr's really good. And uh, although I think technically they had some Westerners in their team, and they were like, yeah, no, the Koreans are in it, man. But then when I've looked into it, Koreans aren't in Dota 2. Like there are some playing in Dota 2, but Korea as a country, a gaming culture, doesn't give a fuck about Dota 2. If I go to PC Bangs now, I will not find anyone playing Dota 2. I'll find dozens playing League of Legends. I'll still find people now. I'm not joking. If I go now, I'll find one guy playing Brood War on his own in the corner. I'll find two guys. Or I'll find a guy playing a racing car game. I won't find anyone playing Dota 2 in a PC Bang. It's just not embraced in the same way. And so you can't say that in in Dota 2, for example, like like, like I said before about CS, okay, and CS, Swedes are the Koreans of, of the game in terms of, like, they're always germinating us with the best top teams. And so in the same way, I guess China overall would be in Dota 2. Yes, they are right now. The difference is, in Counter-Strike and Dota 2, if Koreans came in full ball, like I'm talking, like they did in Brood War and League of Legends, I think they would become the best. Now, whether in these games, would they be the best by most? Probably not, because in these games, they do have their own dominant regions. So, for example, I'm sure China would still have lots of very, very good teams. Maybe Korea would only be as good or the best by a little bit or the best by a couple of teams. Over in Europe, would they be better than Sweden? I actually think they would if they really applied themselves this way. But that, that said, maybe there's different qualities about Counter-Strike as a game that wouldn't work as well. So maybe they wouldn't have the best team. Maybe Sweden could still have the best team, but maybe Korea would have... If they went full ball like League of Legends, or maybe they would have like three or four teams out of the top ten that were all Korean, or two or three out of the top five that were Korean, or maybe they would have the best team and then the fourth best team as well. Whatever it would be, they would be the best overall, or they would be dominant to some degree, or they would just be very good. Maybe let's just put it that way, okay? Now, what would make them this good? First of all, in all these games, we've seen that even in the games where the esports infrastructure doesn't get fully in, in like integrated into the players playing these games, like Quake, Counter Strike, Warcraft Three. The players themselves are still incredibly diligent, the ones who are very good. And they don't get dissuaded, seemingly, by poor results or poor resources or a bad situation. Even if the best players are all playing in another continent in another th- and they don't have good practice, but somehow they have this cultural thing, which you see in their culture in terms of like how hard working they are for like, just in, in everyday jobs, in terms of like their schoolwork and this determination that it's, it's not a good thing entirely. It's good in terms of it produces people who are very successful. But also there's a degree to which, unfortunately, people almost overwork themselves and they feel this almost like compulsion and duty to the degree that sometimes I think they sometimes ruin their lives. So I'm not saying this like Westerners should all be like this. You shouldn't. It's just something that it's just an observation about their culture. But if they apply themselves this way, in this way alone, they'd get good players and good teams. But then you add in their infrastructure where they have, they're the best at making like proper gaming houses where people are dedicated and they place regimented hours and then proper practices where there's... In Korean esports, there is none of this stuff that is in the West where one team doesn't like this one, so they're like, fuck you, we're not practicing you. And this player has beef with that guy, so he just dicks around in practice versus him trying to make him mad. None of that is going on in these Korean practices. Their t- coaches want them to accomplish certain goals and practice certain things, and that's what they're doing in their practice. And the, and the coaches themselves are the one organizing practice, not the players. And so as a result, it's regimented. They're getting the most, they're very efficient, essentially. They're very dedicated, they're very disciplined, and they're efficient. So they're putting the max hours doing it efficiently as they, as they can within their cultural context constraints and they're going full ball without like ego essentially and that's another thing the way they train them also ego is coming out of the equation if you're a star player if you're doing things wrong people are picking up on and the coaches are breaking it down and trying to get you to play this way and trying to explain things to you and showing you examples and saying you know you can't just do that whereas in the west there's a degree to which if you're a great player you have a lot of leeway you can if someone in your team is a lesser player says hey you're doing that wrong you can just sort of be like fuck off mate i'm the best player like the it's a different cultural milieu that they're they're existing in you know so from my observations of these, these pheno- this phenomenon of how Korea gets into the games and seeing it in their results in different games where they've had varying degrees of interest and in esports backing, it's my opinion at the moment, my observation, my, my conclusion at least, that I think they would be the best overall in almost any esports game they got into, at least the ones I've followed. So I'm interested to see, does anyone in some of these games have, have a different opinion? Because I think I've argued it about as well as you can. I've tried to think of counter arguments and the only ones I can really think of are things like maybe in games that count strike, there are degrees where a Western mentality could help you to some degree. Because, for example, one of the things that makes Swedish players very good is they have a very kind of tempered overall mental approach to the game where they don't have a lot of highs and they don't have a lot of lows. They just stay within a certain realm where they're all on a similar page and they play. Now, would that be the same for the Koreans? Would it be a different sort of communication? Okay, I could see we could we could sort of build an argument there. But 
overall, in terms of the practice, in terms of the dedication, I think the Koreans would have enough to be the best and among the best in every single game if they applied themselves.